there's no question, having a Hoya in the White House was a special moment. Uh, it was great to be part of that, great to be affiliated with that. Well, half of the White House um, <laughs> had been through Georgetown. All of us, one way or another, have this kind of Georgetown DNA that intertwines in some of the work that we've done. So we had a common philosophy, if not a common language. It was drilled into you, this sense of there's a world around you, there are people whose lives you should be able to touch and affect. Georgetown influence and color the way I think about the world today and my work in politics and my work in government. From the way I analyze policy issues to the idea that there needs to be an underlying morality and philosophy behind what the government does. The inquisitiveness, the desire to seek truth, the commitment to hear other opinions and understand the other side of the argument better, those serve me very, very well. It's not just social justice, it's involvement. It's that you have an obligation. Uh, to be involved in your community, in your country, in your world. So now my career has been driven by public service, and that started at Georgetown. It just opened the world to me, that there were other places, other people, other things to learn, other opportunities, that you could do all of those things and still have a life that was focused on doing things for others. I was the general counsel for the 92 convention where he was nominated. I proudly accept your nomination for Once President. Bill Clinton was the nominee and you saw him and heard him, there was no question that he had really what it takes. And that's what this election is really all about. There was a group of people, it was a kind of a new generation of political people, people my age, formed kind of the core of the campaign. And it was exciting to work with them, exciting to be part of it, exciting to be working for a candidate so young who wanted to bring about change, a real change in our country. In 1995, he was looking for someone to work on the re-election campaign. I interviewed with a couple of people, and next thing I know, I'm spending 45 minutes one evening in the Oval Office. He had a very firm idea of what he wanted, uh, and at the end of it, I was excited. I was charged up to, you know, to be part of it. If you look at everything from how he ran in 1992 to the work that we did, it was all about building that bridge to the 21st century, to the future. That is where the Georgetown motto comes in hand. Working together, we're here for something bigger than ourselves. I look back with some measure of pride that at the end of the day, we still made some real progress on fundamental issues. Bill Clinton was proud of saying that he helped build a bridge to the 21st century. I look back now and say that that was really true. President has said more than one occasion that he thinks that he would not have been president had he not gone to Georgetown. It was clear that he got some things out of this place that were critical to him and how he viewed the world. Georgetown helped root what he stood for, which is why, over the course of eight years, Georgetown was the place that we made big policy announcements. I thank my former classmates, some of whom I see out here. The important speeches, the broad speeches about setting up, not here's what I'm going to do today, here's what I'm trying to do for the next generation, were given in Gaston Hall. As a Hoy, it made me proud that they were given at Georgetown, and that was no accident. Let us find a new common ground. President Clinton taught all of us who worked for him that the best possible politics was the best possible government. President Clinton really set the groundwork for a lot of the peace and prosperity the country's enjoyed since then. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Michael A. Bailey, Interim Dean, McCourt School of Public Policy, Georgetown University. So thank you. Uh, on behalf of the McCourt School of Public Policy, I'm very, very happy to welcome you. So I am uh, thrilled to see such a packed house with so many students and uh, so many friends of McCourt, including Frank McCourt. Nice to see you. So 25 years ago today, uh, William Jefferson Clinton, a School of Foreign Service 1968 graduate, was elected president. And so our Institute of Politics and Public Service, led by Mo Alethi, has put together a really, really cool uh, set of events to commemorate this time. 
So what I want to do is just lay out a little bit of what has happened before to set the stage for what is to come. So on Friday night, students were able to uh, relive the 1992 election night TV coverage like as it actually unfolded. And as someone who was uh, you know, around in 1992, I can say that's how we really dressed. Um, and we felt very good about it, actually. So then uh, last night, uh, GU Politics, which is the other name for our Institute of Politics and Public Service, uh, they screened the, screened the famous uh, documentary, The War Room. And then, you know, connected with that, we're able to hear from Paul Begala, James Carville, Mandy Grunwald, and Secretary Rodney Slater, um, all of whom were, you know, deeply, deeply involved in the campaign. And so uh, it was incredibly fun, as you can imagine. Then this morning, I had the honor of, of moderating a discussion of Clinton's vision for America. And so there we were able to bring together Maria Echeveste, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, uh, uh, Minya Moore, and Bruce Reed, all of whom were really, really central players uh, in the Clinton administration. That was then followed by uh, School Foreign Service Dean Joel Hellman. And he was able to, uh, he led a discussion with Madeleine Albright, Strobe Talbot, and uh, former President of Mexico Ernesto Zedillo. Again, like the, the heaviest of heavyweights in foreign policy in the Clinton administration and beyond. So following that, then we had uh, uh, McCourt Professor Judy Fader uh, lead a, a discussion that was uh, co-sponsored with our uh, McCourt's Baker Center for Leadership and Governance. And so she was able to talk with Chiefs of Staff, Erskine Bowles, Mac McClarty, and John Podesta. And so now we are coming to the keynote that's going to tie it all together. And so as you know, of course, that's, uh, we're bringing back President Clinton to this place where, in 1991, he kicked off his presidential campaign with a series of speeches uh, making the case for why he should be president. And so I just want to note that, you know, this is an uncertain time. And there's a lot of people, you know, across the political spectru uh, spectrum, and we're wondering about, what do we do, right? What do we do to make things better? Um, and I have to say that it's, it's, it just feels right that in this place, at this time, with this son of Georgetown, we're gonna be able to share something really special. So I'm really, really excited about this. And in order to set the stage for more of what's to come, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the president of Georgetown University, Jack DeJoya. Well, thank you, Dean Bailey. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you to Gaston Hall for today's keynote address, which marks the fourth installment of the Clinton Lectures at Georgetown. We're grateful to have so many distinguished guests in attendance today, including Frank McCourt, Jr., who serves on our board of directors and whose vision enabled us to create the McCourt School of Public Policy in 2013, our first new school in 60 years, and Patricia and John Baker, whose generosity established the Baker Center for Leadership and Governance within the McCourt School. We're also grateful for the partnership and leadership of the members of our community and bringing us together for these conversations. Dean Joel Hellman of our School of Foreign Service, which has begun the celebrations of its 2019 centennial, and Dean Mike Bailey and our extraordinary programs at the McCourt School our Institute of Politics and Public Service, our Baker Center for Leadership and Governance, led by Mo Elithy, and Mo will also moderate our conversation a little bit later in our program today. We're honored this afternoon by the presence of the 42nd President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton, 25 years after his election as President, and almost 50 years since he graduated from our School of Foreign Service and we look forward to the opportunity to hear his reflections on a lifetime of service to our nation. In 2013, we launched the Clinton Lectures, and over the course of four years, President Clinton has returned to campus to offer lectures on the role of people, purpose, and policy in politics. In the days leading up to this, our fourth lecture in this series, as you just heard from Dean Bailey, our community has come together to reflect on the nature of public service in our country in the 25 years since President Clinton's election. 
In the fall of 1991, Governor Clinton, a Democratic candidate for president, spoke here on this stage in Gaston Hall in a series of New Covenant lectures. And he invited those who had gathered to consider, in his words, quote, the responsibilities we owe to ourselves, to one another, and to our nation, close quote. These New Covenant addresses called us to consider the transformative possibilities of public service and to reflect on the ways that each of us can use our individual talents and to work together in service of the common good. Today we reflect on our own role in public service. We invite each of us into a deeper exploration and understanding of a tradition that animates the life of our Georgetown community. As a Catholic and Jesuit institution, we're grounded in a tradition that calls us to be in service to others, to be engaged in the struggle for justice, to be alive, and the words again of President Clinton, to the responsibilities we owe to ourselves, to one another, and to our nation. So I wish to thank all of you for being here this afternoon, and now I wish to invite Kelly Schneider, president of our Georgetown Public Policy Student Association at the McCourt School, former co-chair of the GU Politics Student Advisory Board and a recipient of a Baker Innovation Grant to introduce President Clinton. Good afternoon. My name is Kelly Schneider, and I'm a second year Master's of Public Policy student at the McCourt School of Public Policy. As a student at McCourt, some of my most informative experiences have been through the Institute of Politics and Public Service, or GU Politics. I started off working behind the scenes last year as co-chair of the Student Advisory Board, and am now working as a Baker Innovator with the Baker Center for Leadership and Governance on a project that addresses political polarization and civic education. GU Politics was the catalyst for this work, and I thank them for the opportunity to be at this exciting Clinton Symposium 20 today. It is my honor to introduce William Jefferson Clinton, the 42nd President of the United States of America. President Clinton was born on August 19, 1946 in Hope, Arkansas. He graduated from Georgetown's Walsh School of Foreign Service in 1968, after which he went on first to serve as Governor of Arkansas and then as the President of the United States. We are here today to reflect upon and commemorate the 25th anniversary of this presidential election. Throughout his career, President Clinton has embodied what it means to be a Hoya. Here at Georgetown, both students and alumni understand and strive to be men and women for others. And President Clinton has led by example in this regard. Through establishing and leading the Clinton Foundation, President Clinton has helped millions of people around the world access affordable education. At home in the United States, the foundation is heading initiatives to combat childhood obesity and address emerging health threats like the opioid epidemic. True to his Georgetown education, President Clinton's work faces some of the most pressing challenges of our time head on in helping to ensure the health of our communities and the health of our planet. One thing that I have always admired about President Clinton is his belief that we can do more together than any of us can do on our own. Through organizations like the Clinton Global Initiative, President Clinton has fostered partnerships among governments, businesses, NGOs, and private citizens to give people the tools that they need to better impact their communities. To date, over 3,600 CGI commitments have already improved the lives of more than 435 million people in more than 180 countries. At Georgetown, we deeply understand this obligation to affect change that is larger than ourselves. In this way, President Clinton is not one of our most distinguished alumni only because he was President of the United States, although that certainly is a factor. President Clinton is one of our most distinguished alumni because of his commitment to public service and his work to positively impact this world and the people in it. It is for this reason that the bond between President Clinton and Georgetown is so strong. 
From the beginning of his career, some of President Clinton's most memorable moments as a candidate and as president came from speeches in this very room, and we are excited to welcome him back here today. Before I join you all in welcoming President Clinton to the stage, I have a couple of administrative notes. After President Clinton's keynote address, GU Politics Director Mo Alethi will moderate a Q&A session with the audience. Mo is a longtime Hoya, having obtained his bachelor's from the Walsh School of Foreign Service at GU. He spent two decades as one of the top communication strategists in DC and the Democratic Party, most recently as communications director and chief spokesman of the DNC. Mo is a veteran of four presidential campaigns and a frequent political commentator on the top news networks. Perhaps most importantly to us students here, Mo is also a founding father of GU politics, and he and his team have brought the institute to prominence, both at GU and in Washington, DC. Mo will be moderating a conversation with President Clinton based on questions submitted by students at the door. Lastly, both during the event and the Q&A session, please join the conversation on social media using the hashtag Clinton25 and tagging at GU politics. Now, without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome and Hoya Saxa <laughs> to the, our keynote speaker, the 42nd President of the United States, President William Jefferson Clinton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the uh, welcome. I guess I ought to thank the people who lit gas in for television, because that means I can't spend the whole speech looking at my old friends in the audience. <laughs> President DeJoya, thank you for having me back. Dean Bailey, thank you for your work at the McCourt School. My old friend, <coughs> Mo, did you see him in the movie? Was he in the movie they just showed? He was in one of the films we did. He's great. <laughs> And Hillary and I are both very grateful to him for everything he's done. Thanks to Hannah Hope and the McCourt School team for all they did to make this possible. And I especially want to thank all the members of the administration who were here, who did the panels, and I understand had a good time and did a good job. We had a pretty good time when we were doing the jobs. You know, when I wrote my presidential memoirs, there were more than 25 pages devoted to the time I was here at Georgetown as an undergraduate. And my editor literally forced me to delete 20 more pages. He said, there is no way, no one will believe you remember the names of all these teachers, much less what they said in class, much less all the people you went to school with. Much less everything happened, I said, but I did. <laughs> he said, well, it's just you can't, nobody, you can't have 45 or 50 pages on the four years where you went to college. I could have filled 500. And I am still grateful and still convinced that had I never come here, I would not have become president. And every time I meet a younger person, which is nearly everybody I meet these days, <laughs> uh, I was laughing. I was looking backstage, and I saw Mac McClarty sitting out here, and Milan and Phil Revere, who were in student government with me when I was a freshman. I thought, you know, I spent most of my life being the youngest person doing whatever I was doing. And then one day I woke up, and I was the oldest man in every room. And I could hardly tell you what happened between then and now. 
but it's the life I wish for all of you. In 1991, I came back to Georgetown when I was a candidate for president to give three speeches outlining what I thought the challenges at the time were and a rather detailed set of proposals to address them in domestic economic, social policies, and foreign policy. I called them the New Covenant speeches outlining what I thought the responsibilities of the government were and the citizens were to create a nation of opportunity for all, responsibility from all, and a community of all citizens. This last go-round we had is by no means the first us versus them fight that America has endured. In fact, it's as old as the Republic itself. Then in 1992, shortly after I had been elected, President Tim Healy of Georgetown, thinking I still needed instruction, <laughs> which I did, was drafting a copy of my inaugural speech when he tragically dropped dead in the Newark airport in December of 92. Jack DeJoya found the copy of the speech on his typewriter, and I got it. And he used the phrase in the speech called Force the Spring. He said that the purpose of our election was to force the spring, to give America a new beginning. And his honor, I used it. A couple of days before I was inaugurated, I came here and stood on the steps where George Washington and General Lafayette had stood at Old North to receive the diplomatic corps. I did have two of my class reunions at the White House, but I always loved coming back here for them. And my favorite trips in the last 17 years since I left public office were probably long private walks I took from the home that Hillary and I have a couple miles from here. I just get out and wander up to the campus and talk to the students I ran into, <laughs> walk around and remember. So I'm honored to be back today. And um, I am profoundly grateful to all the people associated with Georgetown who have also been part of the administration. Uh, leading, I suppose, with Professor Albright. But this team of people that did all these panels today deserve an enormous amount of credit for whatever good we were able to do. And what I'd like to do is to try to put it into some context and make it relevant to what you face today. I came back, as President DeJoy has said, over the last few years to talk about a career in public service, whether in public office or not. And I said I learned four basic lessons. Never forget about people. If everything you say and do is focused on somebody else, you'll come out ahead. Never forget that every person has a story. And the purpose of service is to help other people improve those stories, as many of them as you possibly can. Third, never forget that talking is important, but doing matters more. And fourth, if you want to serve an elective office, politics matters. It can make or break a career, but more important, it can make or break a country. The last time I was here, I was asked to talk about the purpose of public service, and I used as Exhibit A Helmut Kohl, the former chancellor of Germany, who since has passed away. We were very good friends and known mostly in the media as our shared joy for going out and overindulging in Italian food at Philomena's restaurant. Cole was a giant of a man. 
who weighed uh, more than 300 pounds most days, but went away for two weeks on a hiking vacation every summer and literally lost 28 pounds every two weeks, just so he could have the joy of putting it back on. <laughs> when I spoke at his funeral, I was asked not to the cathedral in Germany where the family service was held, but to his official state funeral, which was held not in Germany, but in Strasbourg, France, just across the border, at the home of the European Parliament. Because he was in so many ways the father of the European Union. One of the guests there, by the way, was your predecessor, Leo O'Donovan, who was also a good friend of Helmut Kohl. The 21st century in Europe actually began on Helmut Kohl's watch. He was chancellor at the end of the Cold War, and he faced a whole raft of decisions. One, should East and West Germany be reunified? To do it, he knew that he would have to try to move as quickly as possible to raise the living standard of East Germany up to that of West Germany. And to do that, he'd have to send a lot of money from West Germany to East Germany. He'd already been in office quite a while, and he knew it could imperil his ability to stay, both because the West Germans would resent the fact that they were subsidizing the East Germans, and the East Germans would resent it was taking them so long to catch up to the West Germans. It was one of those no good deed goes unpunished deals, but he did it anyway. He reached out to Russia, and with my predecessor, President Bush 41, was the most vigorous supporter of democracy in Russia under the last days of President Gorbachev and the first days of President Yeltsin. He supported the creation of the European Union, so much so that Germany, the dominant economic power, was willing to give the leadership of the European Central Bank first to France, which may not seem like any big deal to you, but until sometime after I left office, the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin was still full of bullet marks from the last war they fought with France. He did all these things because he wanted to build a world that was coming together, not falling apart. He reached out to Russia and supported the European Union and maintained strong ties with the United States, NATO, and he got perm permission to use Russian, I mean German troops outside of Germany for the first time to support our peace mission in Bosnia, which ended a massive upheaval, which had claimed a quarter of a million lives and more than two million refugees. I said to Helmut Kohl, lying in state, a simple thank you. He had a good long life. He was 87 years old. But we owed him our thanks. I have never been to a funeral of a dead politician that had more people from all over the world who served with him. Most of them no longer in office. Most of them just got on an airplane and came to Strasbourg. Why? Because he gave them a chance to be involved in something bigger than themselves. Something that would outlive their fleeting careers and their limited lives something that gave them the feeling that they had done something profoundly important to try to reverse some of the us versus them impulses of European history and give children, grandchildren, and generations to come afterward a better life. That's the kind of politics I want to talk about today. We all need to be involved, whether we're in public office or not, in something bigger than ourselves, in building a better country and a better world. 
for people who haven't had the opportunities that we've all had, and for our, all of our children and grandchildren. When I was a freshman at Georgetown, we all had to take a course called The Evolution of Civilizations, in which the famous professor, Carol Quigley, said that the defining idea of Western civilization, that it enabled us to outperform other civilizations since the age of reason, at least, was that the future could be better than the past, and that every person had a personal, moral responsibility to make it so. That's a pretty heavy dose to lay on an 18-year-old. <laughs> but all these long years later, I remember it well, and I'm grateful that I heard it. America depends on adhering to our version of that conviction. And yet there are many millions of our fellow citizens who don't believe it anymore, who don't believe much of anything anymore, who basically believe that Thomas Hobbes was right, that life is poor, nasty, brutish, and short, and it's our crowd against theirs. The pie is fixed. Might as well fight for a bigger piece of it. And if we stay there, then it will change the nature of service, our ideas of community, and the possibilities of politics from an endless sea of opportunity to a deep swamp of conflict. And We'll be fighting over our economic differences, our social differences, our cultural differences, and not necessarily in that order. At our best, for all of our shortcomings, this country is dynamic, inclusive, always moving toward what our founders called a more perfect union. That's 18th century speak for, hey, we're not perfect. We will never be perfect. But as long as we're trying, we can always do better. And that's been good enough so far. Now, it's easy to say and hard to do. Change is hard. Remember, Niccolo Machiavelli, who was no dummy, said this. There is nothing so difficult to take in hand, more perilous conduct, are more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. We're in the middle of a fundamental struggle to define basically what it means to be an American in the age of interdependence. What does the nation itself mean? The last big struggle we had took place in the 1960s when I was where you are. I showed up as a freshman less than a year after President Kennedy had been assassinated in Dallas. Dallas was then viewed as a ultra-conservative redoubt. Today, Dallas has a gay Latina elected sheriff a forward-looking mayor, and as you saw when they had that terrible shooting there, an amazing police chief, now retired, who lost his own son to violence. It's a very different place. Then while we were here, we watched the Watts riots. We saw Vietnam implode. We saw all the demonstrations against the war. In the spring of our senior year, in April, Martin Luther King was murdered in Memphis. And then just two days before he graduated, Robert Kennedy was killed in Los Angeles. The only thing worth remembering that brought levity was our graduation two days later, which seemed to be 
a proper exclamation point to a lousy week. We were sitting out on the front lawn here, and this enormous storm came up. Lightning appeared in the sky. It was obviously we were about to be drenched. Our graduation didn't seem very important in the larger scheme of things. The mayor of Washington, D.C., whose name was Walter Washington, saved the day with the following commencement speech. I am the only person you know who remembers his college commencement speech. <laughs> here it is. Kids, if we don't get out of here, we're all going to drown. <laughs> if, he said, he said, if you want a copy of my speech, write me and I'll send you one. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> we would have voted for him for president. And soon after, Richard Nixon became president with appeals to law and order, the silent majority, and a promise to end the Vietnam War that was rather vague, but he said it would be peace through strength. George Wallace ran a right-wing populist campaign that did surprisingly well, that sort of presaged what we heard in the 2016 election. But it's important to remember that while all that was going on, a lot of good things were happening, things which led in part to the reaction. Those are the years of the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the open housing law, and all had some Republican support. President George H.W. Bush was the young congressman who voted for the open housing law from Houston, Texas. Medicare and Medicaid passed. If Medicaid hadn't passed providing health for the poorest Americans, it would not have laid the predicate for what later became the Children's Health Insurance Program when I was president and for the major expansion of health care coverage through Medicaid when President Obama was in office. Efforts to protect the environment were picking up steam and culminated in the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency in 1971. Women began to insert their freedom and their right to positions of responsibility too long denied them. But like all changes, they polarized American politics. There was a reaction by the people who believed somebody else's gain had to come at their expense. And it led to a cultural shift that after the interregnum of President Carter, caused by Nixon's resignation, there were 12 years of Republican presidents. When I ran in 92, it was rather like 2016, though, believe it or not, we thought it was pretty polarized then. It was less polarized. And the media was less polarized and a little sh straighter in the nature of the coverage. But we had income inequality. We had alienation. We had unequal opportunities. And we had a lot of a lot of social division. And that's why I came to Georgetown. I said, look, we got to do something about income inequality, but I don't think we can do it unless we can learn to do it together. And I'm not interested in doing it unless we can do it together. As we all know, there's a big debate again today about the fundamental character of America. What are our responsibilities to each other? in an age of unprecedented interdependence and globalization? Is it okay for Facebook to accept a large investment from a Russian billionaire and then have unchecked zillion articles from Russian fake news sites without disclosing it? Is the Logan Act now outdated? The Logan Act makes it a felony for an American citizen to actively conduct a foreign policy in conflict with the American government foreign policy. What's the function of borders? If you put up a wall, you might be able to keep people out, but you can't keep the internet out. You can't keep the ideas out. 
Will robotics and artificial intelligence make this the first technological revolution that will kill more jobs than it creates? And while all this is going on, what do we need a government for? What is the government supposed to do in the economy and dealing with social challenges and in preserving the national security? Do we believe fundamentally in having an inclusive nation of cooperating diverse communities or a nation of exclusive groups with separate interests and goals who believe in order for them to win, someone else has to lose on everything from economic participation to voting rights. In other words, do you believe in a positive sum future, a dynamic, bigger, better, more inclusive one, or a zero sum future where economics is static and there's a limited amount of social capital and cultural standing to go around, so there must always be a loser in order for someone to win. How we think about these things, indeed whether we think about them seriously, will determine our ability to meet all of our other challenges, from income inequality to combating climate change, to making the most of our diversity, to dealing with cyber security issues. These are big problems, but virtually all of our challenges can be foreclosed from being met by the way we think. Now, let me begin by saying, before I get into that, this is like the 1960s. Don't be blinded by the headlines to the positive trend lines. There are a lot of good things going on in this country. Our workforce is relatively young, hardworking, and productive. Our universities and other research institutions are strong in areas very important to our future growth and employment, including material science, software development, nanotechnology, biotechnology, genomics, and many others. We continue to move toward more energy independence and cleaner energy with advances in battery storage for solar and wind energy and vast untapped capacity to generate electricity from both. And the economics are working with us, not against us. But before we ever get to that, we have got to resolve the basic question. And you have to resolve it in your own mind which is more important today, our interesting differences or our common humanity. From a biological point of view, it's interesting since genomically we're all 99.5% the same. Every single difference you can see in this audience. And the student body here is much more interesting even than it was when I was here when compared to my other experiences, it was wildly divorced. This is a very diverse group. Every non-age-related difference you can see in this room is rooted in half a percent of your genome. More than 99.5% of everything you read about in political course, uh, discourse today is focused on the half a percent of you that's different. Interesting, don't you think? If everybody in America knew that one fact, you think it would make any difference? It might, especially if you told it to somebody who doesn't look like you. I think we live in an interdependent world. We can't escape each other. You can build all the walls you want. You can't escape each other. It won't affect cyber terrorism. It won't affect the spreading of radical ideology or inclusive caring communities. The physical, in this case, is not as important as the mental. So, we have to decide whether we're going to think that way. I believe 
that the only sensible solution for a great country like ours, the only move toward a more perfect union, is toward inclusive economics, inclusive societies, inclusive cultures, and inclusive politics. And that includes people who don't vote with us and may not even like us. Everybody should be seen, everybody should be heard. But that requires a certain style of leadership, which again is the province not just of the elected, but of every active citizen. Which kind of leadership do you favor? Blame or responsibility? It makes a big difference in what you do next. Which works better in economics, politics, and social policy? Addition or subtraction? Multiplication or division? You can win more elections in the short run when people are mad with subtraction and division, but it's a lousy way to run a railroad. You won't build much at last that way. And how should decisions be made? On the basis of ideology and triggered reactive emotion, or as best you can, on the basis of evidence and reasoned respect for people that disagree with you. This makes a huge difference. For example, in the last election, in the counties that Hillary carried, you find 64% of America's GDP. In the more numerous rural counties carried by President Trump, you find 36% of the GDP, even though the median income of a Trump voter was higher. What does that tell you? Even poor people are more hopeful if they're in a dynamic place. And being trapped with a lack of mobility is more damaging emotionally and makes you more vulnerable to false claims from my point of view, than if you're poor. It has a devastating effect on people to think that they are powerless to make tomorrow better than today. So, you have to think about it. Should we do something about it? Yes. Is recreating the past an option by running immigrants away and Getting rid of trade? I don't think so. After all, we're only 4% of the world's people, and we've got over 20% of the world's GDP. We have to sell something to somebody else. And in terms of manufacturing, we don't have to do much to get more investment here because the most important things in manufacturing are labor costs, energy costs, materials costs, and transportation costs, and labor is a smaller, it's getting smaller every year because it's so productive. What do you want to happen in Japan on this trip? Toyota has 176,000 employees in America. Want to run them out? So just because the prescription is wrong, however, doesn't negate the legitimacy of the anxiety. Yes, there are 800,000 people working in America in solar and wind energy now and only 77,000 in coal. The problem is none of those 800,000 have gone to coal country, especially to the isolated parts. Do we know how to do something about it? Absolutely we do. But it isn't to deny climate change or try to repeal the obvious economics that are pushing everybody forward. Where Hillary and I live in New York, we're about 10 minutes from the home office of Swiss Re, uh, a Swiss company, one of the largest reinsurance companies in the world. They will not insure coastal cities anymore if they don't mitigate climate change. They just built the largest solar installation in all of Westchester County, New York, on their headquarters grounds to send a clear signal to the people they're working with that they don't care what the politics is, they've measured the risk. Climate change is real, it's a mortal threat to our future, and there's something we can do about it. They're doing their part, they want the rest of us to do ours. That's far more effective 
but you have to find a way to spread the benefits of those opportunities. It's not easy to do, but it's affordable and more than possible. The immigration debate, it's very interesting. Don't you think that the most anti-immigrant populations in America are in places with very few immigrants? In our county, we have a ton of immigrants. And the election results were better than the party uh, registration, from my point of view at least. Partly because people don't feel threatened by it. My local deli is owned by a German immigrant with Polish guys working next to people from Ecuador and the Dominican Republic. Because they're all working together because they think they are part of something that's growing and improving. But it's important that we tell people who disagree with us the facts. From 2010 through 2014, there was no net in migration from Mexico. None. It's amazing, with such a big issue in the election, I didn't hear a single solitary news anchor ask that question. Why are you so upset about this? From 2010 to 2014, Mexico was growing like crazy. The previous president, Calderon, built 140 tuition-free universities. There was a net outflow of 150,000 Mexicans going back. Most of the immigrants who came across the Rio Grande were from Central America under a bill signed by George W. Bush. And bless his heart for doing it, saying that people who are terrified because of narco-trafficking violence living in weak states that, where they can't protect their children have a right to come and seek asylum from us. How many people know that? If they don't, we can't say, well, somebody else should have told them if we haven't done our part. The crime rate among immigrants, all immigrants, including undocumented immigrants, is one half that of the native born. The small business formation rate is twice that of the native born. If every American knew that, it might make a difference. The fear of Muslims overlooks the fact that our country has been deeply enriched by the influx of Muslims to America over the last 30 years. And in spite of the horrible killings at San Bernardino and Fort Hood, and what happened in New York City just a few days ago, the aggregate murder rate of Muslims is one third that of the native born. How many people know that? If all your friends and neighbors knew it, would it make a difference? In a world where we're dominated by 10-second Snapchat and 140-character Twitter, where the very survival of newspapers depends upon their online advertising, which often depends upon how many retweets they get or whether their stories get on the television news, nationally if they're one of the big newspapers or at the states if they're state newspapers. The emotional triggers of bad news are far more profound and therefore more profitable than the good news which it is nevertheless important for Americans to know in order to make good decisions. So should we have borders? Yes. Do any of these so-called sanctuary cities really believe that they're there to harbor serious criminals? No. They're just saying, we're not going to help you round up people who are working hard, paying taxes, raising their kids, and we need them in our community. But I'm watching all these television ads implying that there are literally elected public servants who can't wait to shield serious offenders from the long arm of the law when in fact, in many of these cities, it is the police department that favors the policy being followed by the city government. The mayor of Chicago is nodding his head over there. <laughs> but how many of your fellow citizens know that? Are you just as guilty as they are of only talking to people who agree with you? Keep in mind, if you don't want an us and them world, you can't build your version of it. You have to 
get caught trying. My, my daughter likes to say that may be the most repetitive lesson she ever learned as a child growing up. We always said, it's important to get caught trying. And we have got to avoid this kind of tribalism. I could go through a lot of other issues. How many voters do we have to disenfranchise before we're not America anymore? Do you really think in Michigan, where they had no governor's race, no Senate race, 99,000 people showed up and voted for every race besides president? Did you know that? Is that credible? How, do you know what's happened since the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act in the placement of polling stations in many states? Do you know there's effectively no by highly political groups, even when they know some legitimate voters will be purged along with illegitimate voters? One of the things I really like about George W. Bush is he tried to pass immigration reform. And I tried to help him, and I'm ashamed to say that members of both parties opposed us both. And he would happily go with me to South Texas and debate any policy in the world and believe he could win enough to prevail. That's all anybody should ask. We don't have immigration reform not because of economics, although some people believe it's a problem. We have it because we don't have it because of voting issues. And if we just keep disenfranchising people, then at some point we won't be America anymore. And finally, I'd like to say, I'll show how totally old fashioned I am and probably completely out of date. I don't believe your ability to badmouth somebody else is evidence of authenticity. I don't. My, uh, neither do I believe sanctimony is. I think we should be listening to each other. I think it's okay to treat each other with respect. I think it's okay to hear the other side. And I think it is wrong for you to believe that you can expect the politicians alone to change when they keep being rewarded for us versus them, highly hostile, conflict-embracing uh, conflict policies. So we all have to do that. And um, let me just give you one example. Uh, President Bush, w, George W. Bush and I have a program called the Presidential Leadership Scholarship Program. And we take 60 people a year, equally divided by party, totally diverse by gender, by religion, by sexual identity, by race, by you name it. And these young people are mostly between, they're young to me, old to you. They're mostly from their late 20s to their early 40s. They're mid-career people interested in having, being good citizens, but radically different. And First, they go to his library and to mine, and then to his father's library and to President Johnson's library, and they study four big decisions, one from each president. They look at their teams. They sometimes listen to their teams, if they're still around, and they, they analyze, did, did we make the right decision? Did we make it in the right way? How did it go? What worked? And then they use all this and take it into a discussion of contemporary problems. And without fail, so far, we without fail, the Democrats and the Republicans are shocked at how much they have in common. They are shocked 
and how much they agree with each other. Congressman Delaney's nodding his head. He's the only person I know who's got 50 Republicans and 50 Democrats on an infrastructure bill. But the point is, it's not rocket science. The class before last, we had two incredibly moving combat veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan, both of whom had lost legs, and one of whom had not finished his round of plastic surgery from the cuts he got to his face. By the end of the whole process, they were probably closest to a very large African-American woman who's head of the gay rights movement in Arkansas. And they both came up at the committee and said, you know, we never would have met each other. We never would have known each other. We wouldn't know anything about each other if it hadn't been for that. This is a university. You should try to create something like this everywhere. Not because we should agree all the time, but because we at least should be able to treat each other like human beings without assuming the worst. This us versus them thing is the most dangerous thing we're confronting. But as long as people are rewarded for it politically, it will continue. And the only really political thing I want to say is, if you don't, <laughs> it's on, if you don't vote at midterm elections as well as presidential elections, you are going to make it permanent. Because, because, if two different Americas show up at these different elections, the temptation is almost irresistible for the people who benefit from the midterms, the Republicans, to try to get more people off the rolls so that the presidential years will look more like the midterm years. Meanwhile, we work like crazy trying to register more people, hoping that the midterm years will look more like the presidential years. Meanwhile, there are all these independent forces that for their own reason are trying to convince people not to vote at all or do something else. It's a crazy time. It's more polarized in personal, deeply psychological ways, I think, than when I was elected. I can't imagine anybody passing an assault weapons ban or a 10 bullet ammunition clip limit now. But it's sad. We had another mass shooting yesterday. And I thought to myself, everything we need to be doing here would not interfere with anybody's right to hunt, to engage in sports shooting, or to protect their family. In a normal world, we could talk to one another and say, you know, the kids of this country need a, need a, a hand out, a hand up. People vulnerable. I mean, it's Las Vegas thing, go figure. There's always gonna be crazy people trying to kill people, I suppose, every now and then. But it's a miracle that man didn't kill hundreds of people. And the truth is that some people have concluded that the profits of being able to sell all the ammunition and weapons you can possibly cram into working families' limited budgets by making them terrified somebody's coming to get their guns, or worse, America having the highest gun violence death rate in the world by light years. And that's what happens if you make decisions based on emotion and ideology, not evidence, and when people don't talk enough to each other across the lines that divide them. Look, I grew up in a state, and I was governor of a state, where we had to close a lot of high schools on the first day of deer season because nobody was showing up anyway. <laughs> and I get it. I know what it's like to live in a small rural area where the nearest law enforcement is an hour's drive away and where you can't afford to take vacations and all you've got is hunting and fishing. I understand that. But if people understood 
that you acknowledged their culture and their desire to hunt sports feud and be able to protect themselves in case the police don't arrive the Calvary's late. And then you could say, just please help us stop this. There's no question we don't need to have all these mass killings. No country on earth has anything like the number of mass killings we do. But we don't talk to each other. A lot of people are making a lot of money out of promoting paranoia. But we haven't found the language to overcome it. And we must. This us versus them and a more perfect union have been at war since the beginning of this country. Never forget one of the things engraved on the Jefferson Memorial is when I think of slavery, I tremble to think that God is just. This is a very old story. Almost 150 years ago, Ulysses Grant was elected president. Most people think he was a bad president. Some people, if you grew up in the South like me, you were also taught he was a drunken butcher as a general. Nothing could be further from the truth. He was never known to be drunk on duty, and he was a superb general who revolutionized infantry warfare. He also jumped a horse over a fence at West Point one full foot higher than any other cadet, including all those gallant Confederate soldiers on those beautiful statues sitting on their horses. <laughs> and, and his... <laughs> wait, wait, wait. And his record stood for decades. He was also president of the Literary Society. So Grant becomes president. He gets an attorney general from Georgia, and they break the Ku Klux Klan. Then headed by another remarkable Southern soldier with a romantic name, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Then he gets the 15th Amendment through, guaranteeing the right to vote. And he said that it was the most important amendment since the Constitution itself because otherwise the slaves who were freed would never be equal citizens because they didn't have the franchise. Then, after Reconstruction, the reaction sets in again, and we go back to us versus them fighting a more perfect union. This is a very old story. Every one of us participates in ways large and small and not always political. Think about your own life. You wake up every day and inside, your spirit is like a bunch of scales. Some days the scales weighted toward hope, some days it's weighted toward fear and resentment. And that's what the country's like. You gotta keep pushing toward hope without pushing it so far you're hopelessly naive and foolish and vulnerable. But if you let it give in, to us versus them, at some point, America won't be America anymore. So never forget, no matter how difficult you think things are, there are good things going on that don't necessarily grab the headlines, but are in the trend lines. Never forget, in the end, all that matters is whether people are better off when you stop whatever you're doing than when you started whether children have a better future, and I believe whether we're coming together instead of being torn apart. I mentioned earlier how grateful I was that I sat in Carol Quigley's class 53 years ago and listened to him tell me that I had a personal responsibility to make the future better than the present. He didn't say, but I can say to you, having lost as well as won over a long lifetime, 
that losing is not the end of the world. I will tell you what Hillary and I drilled into our daughter. The important thing is to get caught trying. I was looking at all my Georgetown memorabilia before I came over here. And in one of our yearbooks, there was this lovely feature, uh, photographs of a lot of our professors. One of the things I liked about Georgetown is that teaching counted for more than publishing. And professors would see ordinary schlubs like me. So I turned to the page with Professor Quigley's picture on it. And every picture had under it a favorite quote of the professor. Quigley's quote was from Robert Browning's Andrea del Sarto. A man's reach must exceed his grasp, or <laughs> what's a heaven for? You remember that. Get caught trying. It's worth it. We got to have a united country. We got to have a more perfect union. And us versus them is a dead end in an interdependent world. Good luck and bless you all. It's nice to see you again, Mr. President. Thanks, Mo. Welcome back. So the first time I ever saw you speak was in October of 1991. I was sitting out there. I got a better seat tonight. And what I heard that night when you first delivered your first New Covenant address, really helped reorient my sense of service. And it's what guided me through, through my career in politics and guided me back here to the hilltop. And we've got a, we've got a motto for the Institute of Politics and Public Service. It's that public service is a good thing. Politics can be too. And doesn't feel like it so much as you were talking about tonight. So I wanna start there and continue off of the theme of your remarks. Every question I'm gonna ask is actually coming from a student in here. And you'll forgive me, I'm gonna take a little liberty in that we've grouped several questions together uh, from students that where, where there's a theme. And this stack alone is exactly on the issue you talked about. Catherine Rose wants to know, while you were president, serving with a Republican Congress. How did you find ways to accomplish your goals in a divided government? Several students, Varsha Menem, Gustavo Grodowski, Brendan Eberts, Valentin Corey, want to all know what we can do to begin to break down some of the polarization. And Diego De La Torre wants to know what you think the role of youth are in addressing the polarization. So a little bit about your experience as president with polarization and what we can do moving forward. Well, first of all, when Newt Gingrich became Speaker of the House, he essentially said he was going to become president for domestic affairs. I mean, you can't imagine how they were pretty out there. Said Hillary and I were the enemies of normal Americans. He said a lot of stuff. And it was... So we didn't get much done the first year because they were determined to jam through this agenda, which was going to cut back on health care, get rid of the Department of Education. I don't know, they wanted all kinds of crazy stuff they wanted to do. And <clears throat> so I've, I said, you know, work with me. And we'd already passed the most important deficit reduction measure we'd ever had. We were on our way to a balanced budget. 
I asked them to work with me. They wouldn't do it in 95. So I vetoed two of their budgets and they shut the government down. And there was a very strong adverse reaction to it. And when they sensed that they had gone too far and the public was moving against them, we made a deal, reopened the government. And after that, uh, mostly thanks to Erskine Bowles and his team, they basically made deals with the Congress to try to get things we wanted in ways that would be acceptable to them. And at the time, there were things they wanted for their districts and for the country. At the time, we still had Republicans who supported infrastructure spending. I can't figure out how come we're about to spend one and a half trillion dollars on a tax cut that will mostly benefit people in my income group. Instead of, if we're gonna run the debt up, we ought to at least spend it on infrastructure where there's a high rate of return and we'll get the money back. But anyway, we, <laughs> we, uh, anyway, we, we did the, we made deals. And, you know, we made a lot of deals. Uh, Mike McClary was there, we did NAFTA. It looked like, and then it was my first experience in the truth of Mark Twain's adage that the two things no human being should ever have to watch being made are sausage and laws. <laughs> um, but the Constitution was written to require that. The Constitution should be subtitled, let's make a deal. It's not a sleazy thing. It, it's not a bad thing. You should, now, all the deals should be totally transparent because some deals are bad and some are good. Some are a good expenditure of tax money and an honorable compromise, and some are not. But if it's totally transparent, it's crazy to think it's going to be your way or the highway. So what you want is a good negotiator, and I was really lucky in... in um, and Mac and Erston and Leon Panetta and John Podesta that I had terrific negotiators. They were just good. And we had good help with them. Our teams were good. And we were able to advance our agenda and do what I wanted to do, which is to have inclusive growth for the first time in a long time. And we did. It was uh, the only time since the 70s where the income of the bottom 20% went up in percentage terms about the same as the top 5% and more than the top 20%. And all quintiles rose. And we rose, we grew from the bottom up. Family income went up 17%. For African Americans, 32%. For Latinos, 24%. And white folks weren't mad. Why? Because we were all doing better together. But did I get everything I wanted? No. Did we get health care? No, there was no way they were going to give that. Uh, but we got a lot done. Now, second question was... What can we do? Particularly youth, but what can we do to tackle this? First of all, you can stop things. There were four different attempts by the Republicans. See, you got to understand... Sometimes life's greatest curse are answered prayers. So they had voted 53 times to repeal the health care law, or 50 ever how many times, without and never took the time to figure out what they were going to replace it with. But they were richly rewarded by their voters. You know, you just... And so then they there they were in the driver's seat, and... They had made a whole raft of inconsistent promises, and every one of the versions of the health care, there were four, I think, maybe only three, would have cut millions and millions and millions of people off health care. And those three senators, Collins, Murkowski, and John McCain, you know, they probably saved the Republican Party. Even and they and maybe the Trump administration, if they'd actually passed what they wanted to, then it would have been a calamity. And so I think the what you have to do, first of all, 
is try to beat bad things. Secondly, you ought to be for things. And thirdly, you need to show up. I mean, there, there's a reason that all these efforts are being made to make it harder for people to vote. But the people that are making it harder are people that want to draw the district lines so that every member of the Republican Party will only be afraid of a primary challenge on the right. So there will never be any incentive to do what America requires, which is to listen to one another and have honest compromises. So that even a lot of really good people who mean well are terrified to do the right thing on some of these issues. So you, you ha I would urge you to really become involved in the political process and not forget the midterms and support people running for local office in the state legislature. There's a reason the Koch brothers are spending $400 million in this next election, the midterm. So that's what I would recommend. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, if you're a Republican, I hope you'll vote for somebody that wouldn't mind voting with a Democrat now and then. I mean, this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy that we're fighting each other. The infrastructure bill, this bipartisan infrastructure bill, could pass through the House tomorrow, but they won't let it come to a vote unless it has a majority of the Republicans in Congress. And as a result, we're gummed up, nothing happens. And so I, that's what I would say. I think you ought to do whatever you can if you come from a state that hasn't taken the Medicaid expansion to get people to take it. I mean, it's crazy Virginia hadn't taken it. And it's all the House of Representatives, they won't let it happen. And, that, and the Republicans did a survey which showed, their survey, their choice, who did it, that the state budget would make money that 17,000 jobs would be created and that the overwhelming majority of beneficiaries would be white, non-college educated, working class people and they still wouldn't pass it. And they believe that there's no price to it. So what we've got to do is to just all get our heads on straight again and start, you know, when I was a governor, I spent endless hours with Republican governors debating and working on education reform. And every one of them, including the ones I often disagreed with, was serious, fact-based, knew what they were talking about, had a coherent position whether I agreed with it or not. Now it's just rhetoric, emotion, you know, one long explosion. That's not a good thing. So my advice is, work at the grassroots, and get people to show up and realize that voting for president is never going to be enough, ever. And be active on the social media. This may be the last election where the primary determinant in the polls was the aggregate television news coverage. It may not be that way next time. So you need to really... Make your voice heard. You have more power than ever before, and yet it can be taken away more blithely than ever before. So you need to make sure it's not taken away. This next series of questions was, uh, several students asked these questions of the panelists over the past 24 hours of, of your former staff and, uh, and, and folks on the campaign in both the White House. Uh, we've got several students who want to ask these of you now. Uh, Bert Rechester and Julia Hartnett both want to know what you consider the biggest success of your presidency and time in public service, if you want to broaden it a little bit. And Mark Tremegli and A.J. Stanislaus want to know what you would consider your biggest regret from your presidency or one thing that you might want to change, looking back. I regret that we didn't go in earlier to stop the genocide of Rwanda, we might have saved a couple hundred thousand more lives. 
They all died in 90 days. It was the darnest thing you ever saw, and mostly from machetes. And we never even had a meeting on it because we were so obsessed with getting into Bosnia. And I regret that. And I spent a good part of my life trying to make it up to them. It's impressive, though, that once I, I went there once and a reporter would, got in a cab and said, what do you think about Bill Clinton coming here to help fight AIDS and help the farmers and all this? And he said, oh, I think that's good. And he said, well, what about what he didn't do? He said, well, at least he apologized. Nobody else ever did. And besides that, he didn't make us kill each other. We did it all by ourselves. It's amazing. They, they have an amazing civic ethic there. But I regret that. I, I've often wondered if I had gotten in an airplane after I made my last best offer uh, on the Middle East peace process and flown to every Arab capital, I might have been able to build a pressure on Arafat to take the deal. I'm not sure, but I've often wondered that. Um, domestically, I've often wondered if I had passed welfare reform when the Democratic Congress was there, which would have been easy enough to do since we'd already given, I think, 44 states waivers to pursue welfare reform before any bill ever passed. I wouldn't have had to veto the two that Republicans passed because I didn't want to get rid of the I refused to block grant Medicaid and food aid. Um, and if I'd done that first and waited till after the 94 midterms, whether I'd had a better chance of passing health care. Because I thought we were going to pass health care until Bob Dole changed his position. Senator Dole the, was then the Republican leader, and he knew a lot and cared a lot about health care. And he had a, an aide named Sheila Burke, who was a nurse, I'll never forget, who really cared about it. And um, Bill Crystal and some of those guys came to him and said, look, if you want to run for president in 96, you can't let anything pass. You know, the Clinton will win and the Democrats will be in Congress forever. And if you beat it, we can tell them whatever we want about health care and we'll take the Congress back. And he turned out to be right. And as soon as I knew that was going to happen, I've often wondered if I just turned on a dime, told everybody what was going on, gone ahead and passed welfare reform, which would have probably gotten the Democratic Congress to hold the Congress, that we'd have had a better chance on health care reform. And the NRA might not have been able to take out 12 or 15 of our members, which they did because they voted for the Brady Bill and the assault weapons ban. You have those kind of questions, but when everything's happening at once, and you have to make all these decisions, you're going to have days like that. There'll always be regrets. But I think the most important thing we did was basically prove to the American people that the American government could work for everybody, that we could have, we really could have shared prosperity again, shared mobility again. And I could give you a thousand examples of that. But it really mattered to people. I, I suppose, and it was not just economics, it's society. I, I had a woman, a flight attendant, whose husband was a musician on a flight I took from Washington to New York after I left office. And she came up and she, she said, I want to thank you for the family and medical leave out. And it was the first bill I signed. And it had been vetoed twice before I became president. So I didn't have a lot of heavy lifting to do. I just had to get it through a third time and sign it. She said, my, both my parents were dying at the same time. And my sister and I, were they couldn't afford care. So we cared for them. And because of the Family Medical Leave Act, we were able to do it without losing our jobs. She said, I noticed there's a lot of rhetoric from the other side about family values. But I think how your parents die is a very important family value. I'll never forget that as long as I live, just a person. So I, I think the most important thing I did domestically was just make people feel like they were part of America, that we cared about all of them, and we could rise together. And it, restoring shared prosperity, I think, is very important 
for social and cultural reasons. It will help us to make people more inclusive on the other fronts too and help make people think they're not being taken for a ride. You mentioned the, uh, the Middle East peace process. Tom Ashkenazi asks, 22 years after the Rabin assassination, is there still hope? That's probably the worst day I had as president, the year he, the day he was killed, because, you know, sometimes political assassinations don't work. Sometimes they boomerang. Like at John Wilkes Booth got a harsher reconstruction for the South than he would have gotten these, what the Congress tried to impose if he hadn't murdered Lincoln, though Andrew Johnson got weak need about it. Um, but the young man who murdered Rabin knew what he was doing. If he, if he hadn't killed him, he would have had peace in the Middle East by 98, I'm convinced of it. And he still has no remorse, and he's still kind of a public hero to the people who believe that God intended Israel to have Judea and Samaria, which is the entire West Bank. And uh, so what's happened since then is that with the fracturing of Israeli politics, and uh, ironically, the steadfast devotion of President Abbas, who runs the Palestinian government on the West Bank, contrasted with the uh, more aggressive hostility of the Hamas-run government in Gaza, is that Israel has felt remarkably little pressure to continue to make progress. And their politics are now organized, their coalition politics. So it's kind of like the Republican House. All their pressure is coming from the right. So is it possible? Yes, because I think Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and a lot of other places would like to be partners with Israel in a modernization project. And they, but they can't do it without some settlement. The details, however, will be harder. There's no way they can get a deal as good as I got the Israeli government to offer them in 2000. There's no way because then you could get 97% of the settlers on 3% of the land adjacent to the 67 borders. And then Israel was going to give a commensurate amount of land either to the West Bank or Gaza. And we're more or less open to what, whichever one the Palestinians wanted the most. Now, it takes something like 6% of the land to get 80% of the settlers. And the other 20% out there. And if you remember what happened when Ariel Sharon unilaterally cleared the settlers out of Gaza, far fewer, there, it was a mess. So unless they can work out some dual citizenship or joint protection agreement or something, it's going to, the details are going to be harder. But if the leaders wanted enough, they could get it. All along, uh, there have been countless polls in Israel showing that anything Netanyahu would accept, 60% of the Israelis would support. So I, I think... You know, nobody's come up with a better idea. And they may all have decided now that the status quo is better than the blood that will flow if they try to make any kind of deal. But I'd, uh, I wouldn't give it up. And if you think about, it's crazy. You think about Israel last year got like half of all the private capital in the world invested for cybersecurity. It's stunning ought to scare and bother you that we don't, we aren't even doing more. And you got all these uh, Saudi kings going to let women drive. I hope you'll let them thrive too. Um, and the, the Emirates and, and the, the, you know, especially Dubai and Abu Dhabi, they're trying to modernize and 
they would all like it if they had an agreement with Israel. And it would be good for Israel's security. I just don't know. They're, they're, the West Bank is a can of worms now. And they're stuck with Hamas uh, because Hamas was basically won a foolish election, I think. President Bush's administration forced them to have elections. And then the PLO foolishly ran two candidates in a lot of parliamentary districts. Remember, Madeline? They ran, they had a militant wing, they had a militant wing and a more moderate wing, and they thought Hamas was no sweat, so Hamas only had to finish first. So they wound up with 59% of the cabinet positions in Gaza, getting only 43% of the vote. So we're stuck with that. So I guess the, the mega politics are better than they've been in a long time. The micro details are a headache and a nightmare. This final series, I'm going to ask you to come back to Georgetown. You're coming up on your, on your reunion, your 50th reunion, uh, next year from the School of Foreign Service. <laughs> This is actually very cool for me. A couple of just SFS grads hanging out and talking in Gaston Hall. It's pretty great. Um, thinking back on your time at Georgetown, Thomas Connolly wants to know if you've got a favorite memory from your time here. Andrew Kaplan wants to know what opportunities would you recommend current Georgetown students take advantage of to follow a similar career path in public service? <laughs> Dewey May asks, in retrospect, is there anything you would have done differently while you were here? Well, first of all, let me answer the, the I'll answer the, what about your path? You have to pick your own path. But I think that the least important thing is what you get a degree in. That is, I think you should get a degree in something you care about. That will develop your mind and activate your capacity to think and to stay hungry, to want to know. There will come a time again, believe it or not, when knowledge will be valued. <laughs> and there will. And, and uh, when it will matter. And my advice is to think big and start small. That is, just if you want to run for office, you got to figure out how it works. And it works differently. I'm not... And you have to understand also what you can give away and what you can't. I had a lot of fun trying to persuade people who thought they would never vote for me because I was a Democrat and I was, you know, for civil rights and progressive and actually believed it was worth paying taxes to educate kids, that they probably ought to do that. So, but you got to, it takes practice. You have to listen and learn. And... The one thing I would say is this student body here is so diverse now, I would spend as much time as I could trying to just get to know people and figure them out. You know, the funniest thing, I got a big kick out of watching my classmates talk. You know, did, is that the one you showed with? Was earlier today. Yeah. So you had one of them was Kit Ashby, who I think is probably here who I made ambassador to Uruguay, we fought like hell over everything. But it was good for me. And uh, Turkey Faisal was interviewed. And uh, when I became president, he was the head of the Saudi, basically, intelligence services, and was for 24 years. And on my 21st birthday, I spent a few hours 
sharing my class notes. And of course, we were in at summer school because he we, he went even less frequently than I did. And <laughs> and uh, and anyway, so he ne he never went, and I gave him the other day, But he was really smart. He's a very smart guy. So he made it be in the course. And I'll never forget the first time I showed up in Saudi Arabia and I went out somewhere because the king was away from the capital. We were in this big tent and everybody was dressed up in their long flowing robes. And I'm going there shaking hands with everybody, you know, trying to keep a straight face when I shook hands with Turkey, you know, and I, all the time I was thinking, you can finally pay me back for what I did. <laughs> and that's good. But he will tell you I never called the dead in. Anyway, the, I, I, I think that's the most important thing. Make the most of your time here with your studies. It doesn't matter what you get a degree in. It matters how your mind works. And spend a lot of time with people who are different from you. Not just look different, but think different. Who have different skill sets and different blocks of knowledge. And uh, that's it. And then if you want to get in it, go out and get involved. But uh, as I told you, I, I don't necessarily have an enduring memory. But I do remember a phenomenal. I, I had a, a course in the... the it was called Comparative Cultures, but it's basically a history of world religion. And every non-Catholic took it. So it was subtitled Buddhism for Baptists. Uh, but, <laughs> but it was taught by a man named Joseph Seabees, who was a fascinating man. He had been a Jesuit missionary in China, when the communists won, and they didn't like him very much. So they kept him for a good long while in a cell that was basically a four by four hole dug in the ground. He was, suffered serious damage, uh, which affected the whole rest of his life. And there were people from all over the world there, so he offered he knew a lot of our students who were from other countries didn't speak good English. So he offered the final in nine languages. He said, I'll give you an oral exam. And he gave everybody a chance to take the oral in nine languages. And it had a profound impact on me. I really, I liked him a lot anyway. And he, but we used to fight over the Vietnam War. I worked for Senator Fulbright. He was leading the forces in the Congress to try to change our policy in Vietnam. CV was, when it came to Vietnam, he was in that hole in China. He it was, we were fighting the communists. But he finally looked at me and he said, when we had a huge student fight once, he said, Mr. Clinton, he said, I suppose we are friends because we have the same enemies. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the point of that. I lost the race once here when I was running for office, partly because I was in a very small minority of students who was opposed to changing the curriculum, which was still much more based on the old Jesuit ratio studiorum. And, I, and when I was here, you had to take six courses a semester for two years, 18 or 19 hours, and you didn't get an elective until the second semester of your junior year. And it was, you know, inconsistent with the rage that was sweeping through the 60s. Everything was new age. And I was opposed. And I got the living daylight speed out of me in this race. <laughs> and I was glad enough I had a job in hell and I needed to go do it anyway. But, <laughs> but, the, uh, but I'm telling you that because all these years later, I still remember him standing up there. He'd walk into class one day and say, you know what happened on this day in 1435 or something? And he wasn't playing games. He could remember it. And then he had been a, he'd been a schoolboy on the grounds 
till he was nine, of a little town in Hungary with another man who became a Jesuit named Zarini who showed up here, who had five classes in economics of 40 students apiece, as I remember. And everybody was required to sit in a assigned seat and attend class till Thanksgiving, after which you never had to come again, and if you did, you could sit wherever you wanted. At the end of the second semester, not the first, I was walking down the hall with one of my classmates, and he said, Father Zarini, I'm really worried about my test. And he looked at him and said, what do you expect? You missed three classes this semester. Not the first semester, the second one. He literally had, in his mind, kept attendance on 200 people in five classes. So I decided that there was something to be said for hard work and thinking and developing your mind. And so I spent my life in a much more irrational, emotion-charged, you know, rough-and-tumble sport. But I keep trying to get people to think, and I think it was in no small measure because of what happened to me then. My most enduring memory of Georgetown was when Otto Hentz took me for a hamburger and asked me if I'd like to be a Jesuit. <laughs> and first of all, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I was a freshman from Arkansas, and here's this guy asking me, he's going to go buy me a hamburger at Howard Johnson, which was more than my daily allowance would be. I was living on a dollar a day. And... Um, I looked at him and I said, well, don't I have to, don't I have to be a Catholic first? <laughs> and it was one of the greatest compliments I ever got. He said, what do you mean you're not a Catholic? I said, I'm a Southern Baptist. He said, I don't believe you. He said, <laughs> he, I said, why? He said, I read all your exams and you think just like we do. And I said, I, I, I'm not worthy of the compliment, but I'm still living with it after all these years. 50, <laughs> 49 years ago, and I remember like it was yesterday. Thank you. Mr. President.